like to thank uh, Stanley Temple for uh, joining us today. He is a professor emeritus of environmental studies at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And he's also a senior research fellow at uh, the Aldo Leopold Institute. And uh, we're looking at a program here on Aldo Leopold, climate change and phenology. I uh, hopefully I got everything right, Stanley. So I'll turn it over to you now. Okay, thank you very much, Tom. Well, I always enjoy speaking to master gardener groups on this particular topic because it's one that most of you are quite familiar with and probably are already at least informally keeping track of uh, seasonal events, especially in the in the plant world. And of course, I'm glad to see that so many of you are actually uh, going to be sitting through a webinar today when we're going to experience the warmest day of the year. Going to be a, a wonderful uh, introduction to spring when lots of phenological events are going to be happening. Phenology, of course, is the study of the timing of seasonal events. And it's something that human beings have probably been doing for millennia, but only recently has it become a, a sort of a formal um, science. And it's one that Aldo Leopold played a, a, a big role in during, uh, during his life. And now, uh, decades after Leopold's uh, passing, um, his records have become incredibly important for understanding how plants and animals are adapting to climate change. So for those of you in Wisconsin who probably know quite a bit about Aldo Leopold, the background here is Leopold's shack, uh, the setting for his book, A Sand County Almanac, which I hope all of you have read. And if you haven't, I'll put on my Professor Emeritus Cap and give you a, a homework assignment to uh, get yourself a copy and read it. You'll definitely enjoy it. So the quote at the bottom is from one of Aldo Leopold's papers on phenology. And it, to some extent, it's a, an autobiographical statement. He says, keeping records enhances the pleasure of the search and the chance of finding order and meaning in these events. And for Aldo Leopold throughout his entire life, literally from grade school until uh, moments before he died, uh, he was keeping records. He was keeping journals in which he recorded his observations of the natural world. And throughout his life, it was always about the pleasure of the search. And it was only really sort of in mid-career that Leopold started to go back to his notes and start to try to find order and meaning in the things that he had observed and recorded in his journals. So this picture of the shack uh, features a lilac bush at the corner of the shack, um, something that Alta Leopold's wife Estella planted to dress up the place a bit. And uh, remember that lilac bush because I'll return to that later uh, in the lecture. So for most of us, we um, know Aldo Leopold as the author of A Sand County Almanac. Um, and certainly A Sand County Almanac stands as one of the most significant pieces of literature that is based on phenology. And as all of you who've read the book know, the first half of the book is essentially um, a summary of some of the phenological observations that Leopold made at the shack month by month, picking an iconic species uh, to write an engaging uh, essay about. But it's all, of course, structured around phenology and Leopold's detailed phenological records. In the introduction to Sand County Almanac, Leopold um, had, had this to say, that um, this philosophy of land, which was his land ethic, uh, wasn't always clear to me. It's the result of the end result of his life journey. And that life journey is a pretty remarkable one. Um, Leopold, as many of you know, um, is one of the central figures in the emergence of the modern conservation movement here in, in the United States. It starts out as a young boy growing up in Burlington, Iowa, in which he's an outdoorsy kid, loves natural history studies, hunting, fishing, anything that gets him in the out of doors. He begins his professional career in forestry because in the early part of the 20th century, it was literally the only professional career that one could enter that would sort of include all of the things that Leopold was most passionate about. 
He pretty quickly shifts though from forestry to his real passion, which was wildlife conservation. And in the process of shifting careers, the early part of his career is in the US Forest Service on publicly owned lands in the Southwest. But in mid-career, he comes back to the Midwest and uh, spends the rest of his life uh, working on conservation issues on privately owned lands here in the Midwest. And finally, that end result that he talked about was his realization that our relationship with nature had to have an ethical basis. And he proposed his land ethic as a way to establish that ethical relationship with the natural world. So as I said, it all begins as a young boy growing up in, in Iowa. And he had several important influences that led to his passionate phenology record keeping. Um, not the least of which were his parents. His father was a very, um, very active outdoorsman and encouraged his young son to be engaging in outdoor activities whenever he could. His mother <clears throat> required her young son not only to be well read, uh, but that he could write well, and especially that he began at a very young age keeping a daily journal. And for Aldo Leopold, that daily journal um, gives you a glimpse of what is to come later in his life. Here's an example of his grade school journal in which you can see that it is essentially a phenological record. He's taking uh, note of when plants are blooming, when birds are arriving. And this is undoubtedly the result of a third influence on Aldo Leopold, which was a, a remarkably early and prescient uh, program called the Nature Study Movement. From the late 19th century into the early 20th century, this was a program that uh, affected school children throughout the nation. It was uh, a series of, of lesson plans, I guess we might say, that were given to teachers around the country. And uh, those lesson plans encouraged young people, especially in grade school, to get out of the classroom, in, sort of embed themselves in nature and make observations and then come back to the classroom and try to figure out what those observations meant. And one of the popular exercises, of course, was keeping phenological records, which obviously inspired Aldo Leopold from a very early age to begin uh, keeping these phenological records. He goes off to uh, boarding school in the East in New Jersey, and um, he is still uh, keeping these phenological records. His, his handwriting improves, uh, but he's still keeping these lists of when he sees things happening. In this case, for 1903, it's when he sees the first migratory uh, birds uh, arriving for, for the year. But it's, it's while he's in school back east that something rather significant happens. And that is that his journals sort of start to shift from just keeping lists of things and dates on which he saw the first occurrence of whatever event might be. But he starts to sort of write about those events and interpret the things that he's seeing. So here's an example of his journal from, from March of 1904. He makes a really interesting observation that he sees the first Eastern Phoebe of the year. Any of you who are bird watchers know that Eastern Phoebes are one of the earliest arriving sort of insectivorous birds. And many of the early arriving birds in fact arrive so early that they get caught by a sudden cold snap and actually perish. But Leopold is making this interesting connection between two phenological events, the arrival of the first Phoebe and the fact that he has found them around a patch of skunk cabbage. For all of you master gardeners, you know that skunk cabbage is one of the earliest blooming spring wildflowers. And it is distinctive, not only because it stinks, um, and has a very uh, pungent odor, but also because it's capable of producing heat. And that means that in a cold snap, flying insects will often be drawn to skunk cabbage, both because of the odor and because of the warmth. And Leopold makes the observation that Phoebes cluster around skunk cabbage because when there's a cold snap and insects are not flying, it's possible to find insects that are still active around a skunk cabbage plant. It's a really important connection that he's made between two species that might actually be a matter of life or death for an early arriving Phoebe. Uh, 
So remember that as well, because I'm going to return to this observation later as well. So a few years ago, I had an opportunity to visit the school, Lawrenceville School uh, in Lawrenceville, New Jersey. And uh, one of the requirements in addition to uh, lecturing to the students was to take them out on a field trip. And we decided we were going to go back to Aldo Leopold's journals from when he was a student there and try to visit some of the places that he spent a lot of time at. And one of those was the place that Leopold called the Big Woods. The Big Woods is now a protected natural area. And when we took the field trip there, uh, we discovered that this was the site of Leopold's observation of Phoebe's and skunk cabbage right at this junction of two streams where there's a, a marshy area. And sure enough, a century, more than a century uh, later, there was still a large patch of skunk cabbage there, which the students thought was remarkable. So after he graduates from Yale University with a degree in forestry, um, Aldo Leopold begins his professional career um, with the US Forest Service in the Southwest in Arizona and New Mexico. And it was here really for the first time that his journals start to be more than just about the pleasure of the search. For the first time, the things that he's recording in his, uh, especially his professional journals, Leopold is well aware that he's now collecting observations that will have to turn into data, that he's going to have to go back and review his journals when he writes up his reports about his inspection of the newly created national forest. So Leopold has now come sort of full circle, always about the pleasure of the search, but now for the first time, keeping records that he's well aware he will have to return to later and retrospectively sort of make some sense out of. So Leopold quits the Forest Service uh, in the late 1920s, um, a really bold move at the time because of course, he has risen to a very prominent position in the US Forest Service. He was the associate director of the Forest Products Laboratory in Madison, Wisconsin, but he became very frustrated with the Forest Service because uh, uh, the agency just simply wasn't getting on with some of the more progressive ideas that he was introducing. So he quits cold turkey and decides he's gonna devote the rest of his career to, uh, to wild wildlife conservation. And fortunately, a few years later, the University of Wisconsin recognizes Leopold's potential and appoints him as the first professor at any university anywhere in the world devoted to this new discipline of wildlife management that Leopold had just really introduced to the world in his 1933 book. So 1933 was a big year for Aldo Leopold and he's back now in the Midwest and will spend the rest of his life here at the University of Wisconsin and as a Midwesterner. And of course, just a couple of years after he takes his position at the university, Leopold acquires the worn out farm uh, on which the shack was the only building still standing. It became the Leopold family's weekend retreat from Madison. They spent almost literally every weekend of the year uh, trudging up to, to Baraboo to the banks of the Wisconsin River uh, to spend weekends and holidays at, at the shack. It was really quite a family affair. Um, Leopold students were often invited to come along, but an important part of those visits to the shack was keeping records. In the lower photograph here, you can see Leopold with his, uh, his journal uh, writing out the observations that he's made uh, for, the, for the day. So for Leopold, keeping records now at the shack uh, becomes perhaps the most sophisticated record keeping of his career. He's a very sophisticated naturalist and he's able now to monitor over 300 species of plants and animals in the vicinity of the shack and of course uh, in Madison and record uh, the phenological events of the year <clears throat> based on these uh, 300 native species. And of course, as you're all aware, as I said earlier, he goes back to his journals to uh, derive the material for the essays in the first half of the book, A Sand County Almanac. So for Leopold, it's during those final years of his life from 1935 when he acquires the shack till 1948 when he dies of a heart attack there, uh, 
those were the uh, years of his life when his phenological record keeping reaches its sort of peak in terms of sophistication and the number of species that he routinely uh, monitors. Here's an example of Aldo, of a page from Aldo Leopold's Shack journals. And uh, fortunately for us, you know, he has very neat handwriting, but here's the excerpt from uh, a page from the first week in, in May. And you can see he starts out by summarizing the uh, weather for the weekend. They had two inches of, of snow that first weekend in May. Uh, but then he launches right into phenology and the various plants and animals that the family observed and thought might be a significant observation, that it might indeed be the first observation of that species for the year. So you can see for that first weekend in May, they were observing uh, pasque flowers, the, uh, the lilac leaves, uh, um, many migratory birds were coming back. But you'll also notice if you look carefully that over some of these observations, there's a little tick mark. And that little tick mark is evidence that Leopold has gone back through his journals and he has extracted that particular observation as being the first observation of the year for that particular uh, event. So anything that has a tick mark here, Leopold has essentially now extracted from his journals as a piece of data. And of course, the first week in May is one of the busiest uh, weeks, probably if you're a bird watcher. And sure enough, lots of birds are showing up for the first time, including, underlined in red here, the great crested flycatcher arriving for the first time the first week in May. Uh, remember that observation as well, because I'm going to return to it later uh, in, the, in the presentation. But Leopold's journals are meticulous in observing so many different things um, and doing it in such a, a, a systematic sort of way. And being a curious naturalist, Leopold eventually decides he's going to try to make order and meaning out of these events. And that's what these little tick marks are all about. It's Leopold going back to these journals, which up to this point are really just about recording the, the pleasurable weekends that the family spent um, at the shack. But now he's turning it into data. And he enters all of those observations into what I have often phrased as a, a 1945 Excel spreadsheet. It's literally dozens and dozens and dozens of pages of Leopold summarizing all of those observations of plants and animals and recording the dates on which um, various events occurred um, each, each year. And it's amazing to me that he was able to go through all of these hundreds of events and pages and pages of summarized observations and actually make sense out of it. But Leopold, being a good naturalist, was uh, very talented, very good at detecting patterns. And he did detect patterns in, in the data. And once he did that, he, um, he wrote it up in a, a very important paper which he published in 1947, Phenological Record for Sauk and Dane Counties, uh, Wisconsin. So he's summarizing a decade from 1935 to 45 of his observations at the shack, the family's observations, the observations that he and his students were making in Madison. And he gets it published in the premier ecological journal, um, Ecological Monographs, published by the Ecological Society of America. This is really, Kind of remarkable because at the time the science of ecology was fairly young and it was struggling to try to convince the rest of the natural sciences uh, that ecology was more than just another word for natural history studies, that this was really a serious science. And phenology, for better or worse, was clearly associated with natural history studies. Natural history studies in which people make observations and then kind of retrospectively try to make sense out of it rather than the scientific method where you form a hypothesis and then go out and deliberately collect data to try to test that hypothesis. So the fact that the premier ecological journal published this paper um, was kind of remarkable because it was so purely natural history. 
And I suspect it was because in 1947, Aldo Leopold was the president elect of the Ecological Society of America. And probably the editor was not uh, going to be uh, very eager to reject a paper by the incoming president. But the paper itself is really a remarkable one because for the first time, someone has treated phenological records as real serious science. And Leopold uncovers all kinds of patterns in his data uh, that reveals, among other things, a strong relationship between when seasonal events happen for some species and temperature, but not for other species. He goes on to make many other uh, conclusions, uh, but the paper is largely ignored. Uh, no one paid much attention to it um, until, of course, almost 40 years later, when anthropogenic climate change started to become a, a real issue for scientists to investigate. And they discovered all the Leopold's records provided this amazing historical reference point for how phenological events have changed in a world of climate change. And among the first to actually recognize this and publish a paper on it was Aldo Leopold's daughter, Nina Leopold Bradley. She returned to Wisconsin in her retirement in 1976 and built her retirement home just down the road from the Leopold shack. And remembering with fond memories, the uh, times that she and the rest of the family spent keeping phenological records, Nina resumed keeping phenological records and did so for the rest of her life. And like her father, she was curious enough to uh, recognize that there were patterns in some of the observations that she made. And those patterns were quite different from some of the patterns that her father had observed uh, back in the 1930s and 40s. And Nina published a, a short little paper in 1999 in which she made the observation that among some of the uh, species that she was monitoring, some, but not all of the events were happening significantly earlier in her records than they had in her father's records. And she makes the implication uh, that this was consistent with the fact that the climate was changing and that especially spring was coming earlier and was warmer than it had been in her father's time, which she thought uh, might explain why some of these plants and animals were undertaking their seasonal events earlier than they had uh, in her father's time. So she was, oh, she was pretty much on, on safe, safe ground uh, because the climatologists had, of course, already demonstrated that in the vicinity of the Leopold Shack, spring temperatures during March, April, and May had already increased by 1.7 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, so there was a significant increase in spring temperatures uh, that Nina thought might explain why some of these events were happening uh, earlier. So her approach was to compare the average temperature, the average date on which things occurred in her father's records versus her records. So for example, for a number of plant species, uh, for Columbine, for example, she observed that in her father's records, the first blooms occurred on May 19th, but in her records, the first blooms occurred on May 9th, so a full 10 days earlier. So that was an example of a plant that was obviously responding to climate change and blooming earlier, but then there are species like dogbane uh, that is not really shifting the timing of its blooming, uh, in response to climate change. So for Nina, uh, she essentially repeated the conclusion that her father had reached decades earlier, that some species seem to be sensitive to temperature and some are not. Some of you who've read a Sand County Almanac will remember that the species that is the topic of the July essay uh, is the compass plant. And at least in Leopold's time, it was the perfect candidate for the July essay because on average, it bloomed July 15th, right in the middle of, of the month. Now in Nina's records, um, it would no longer be the appropriate uh, species for a July essay because it's now blooming for the first time in, in late June. 
The same things were happening really with animals, and that is that some species were responding to climate change and shifting the timing of their important seasonal events where other species weren't. So for resident birds, birds that are here throughout the year, they pretty consistently are responding to climate change and are beginning their seasonal activities earlier than they had uh, in, in all those times. So for Northern Cardinals, their first territorial songs are now being given almost two weeks earlier uh, than, they, than they did earlier. The same is true for short distance migrants, for birds that really don't go that far south of Wisconsin and, and some of which don't even leave at all. Things like the American Robin. Uh, for them, uh, Aldo Leopold's records had them arriving for the first time on March 19th. Nina's records had them arriving on March 5th, full two weeks earlier. And of course, as many of you are aware now, winters have become mild enough that uh, American robins are now in large numbers actually not leaving on migration, but are actually sp spending the entire winter in Wisconsin. But for long distance migrants, we see a very different pattern. Something like a wood thrush that migrates all the way down to Central America. Uh, they are still arriving on exactly the same date pretty much as they did um, in the past. And this to some extent makes sense because if you're a wood thrush, lucky enough to spend your winter in Costa Rica, um, you don't have any idea what the climate in Wisconsin is like. Instead, um, you're going to time your northward migration in the spring by photo period, by day length. And that, of course, has not changed over time. So wood thrushes that are spending the winter in Central America are still getting the photoperiodic cue to begin their northward migration at the same time as they always have. So here with plants and animals, we see that some species are responding and some are not. Well, this approach that Nina used in her paper of comparing then versus now um, led to a, a lot of criticism of this paper by climate change deniers, essentially, who pointed out that how could you blame this on climate change when so many things had changed since the 1930s to Nina's time? Uh, they pointed out not the least of which is that the entire ecosystem around the shack had changed because of the ecological restoration work that the Leopold family had uh, undertaken and that had finally sort of reached maturity. They pointed out that an interstate highway went by just a short distance away and that many other things had changed. How could you single out climate change as being responsible for these changes in the phenological record? So, we decided that uh, one way to get around this criticism was rather than making that then versus now comparison was to actually look at the relationship between the timing of when things were happening and temperature. This relationship, of course, focuses more directly on cause and effect, and it allows for something that the then versus now comparisons simply can't do and that is, it allows us to make predictions about how phenology might change when temperatures continue to warm and reach unprecedented uh, levels. So we redid the analysis, completely redid the analysis, looking at the relationship between temperature and when seasonal events occurred. And as all of you are well aware, Wisconsin is a rather, a convenient place to do this because spring temperatures during March, April, and May, when, when so many uh, phenological events happen, are really highly variable from year to year. Here's the long-term temperature record for spring, showing the average on the horizontal line. The red peaks are springs in which the temperature is warmer than normal, uh, the blue troughs when spring temperatures were uh, colder than normal. And this is a good thing because it means we have a lot of variation in spring temperatures against which we can compare uh, when phenological events, when seasonal events actually uh, took place. 
And it's also fortunate that um, during this period, uh, we have a lot of phenological data to deal with. We have records that go all the way back to the early 20th century when uh, one of Wisconsin's premier naturalists, A.W., Bill Shorger, uh, started keeping records because as a child, he had been exposed to the uh, nature study movement the same way Alta Leopold had. Um, and he started keeping phenological records in, in Madison um, way back in, in 1908. Aldo Leopold um, keeps his records, of course, during the 1930s and 40s. And Nina starts keeping her records in, in the 1970s. Sort of coincidentally, uh, Nina arrived in Wisconsin in retirement the same year that I arrived in Wisconsin to take up the faculty position at the University of Wisconsin that her father had once held. And I am definitely a throwback to old fashioned natural history studies and have been keeping phenological records myself, especially for birds uh, since childhood. So for Southern South Central Wisconsin, we have over a century of phenological records kept by naturalists who are keeping track of not just domesticated plants, but are keeping track of hundreds of species of native plants and, and animals, a really remarkable uh, record to, uh, to analyze. And when I went back and, and analyzed these records, um, it was very obvious that there were strong relationships for some species between the timing of their seasonal events and the spring temperatures. So I was quite excited actually to see whether those relationships gave us the ability to predict what might occur uh, under unprecedented spring temperatures that the climatologists predict we're gonna be experiencing uh, in the not too distant future. So if we compared two closely related species as examples, the American robin and the wood thrush. You remember the American robin responded to climate change and was arriving earlier. The wood thrush uh, was not responding and was still arriving from migration at about the same, the same time. So how did their spring arrival dates vary with spring temperature over the past century? Well, when, whoops, when we plot the uh, records of arrival dates versus the average spring temperature, we see for the American robin a pretty strong relationship. And that is that in the warmest springs of the year of, of that century, when the temperature um, was very warm, when it was uh, 50 degrees or warmer, you can see that the robins are arriving on the 60th day of the year. At the other extreme and the coldest springs of the century, you can see that American robins are arriving on the 90th uh, day of the year. So a full month difference um, between warm springs and cold springs in when robins make their arrival in South Central uh, Wisconsin. And you'll notice there's a fair amount of scatter around the trend line here. And it turns out that that scatter is largely due to weather. But you go back and look at the individual years in the record, uh, of course, not only are we experiencing differences in the average spring temperature, but day to day and week to week, there's also spring weather to contend with. And in many years, the um, dates on which robins were arriving late, later than the trend predicted, uh, was when there was a weather condition that basically blocked their migration. And often when they were arriving earlier than predicted was when the weather was really nice and allowed them to make their way north earlier. But the important thing here is that we can get a trend, we can get a relationship between when something happens and temperature, and we can calculate a regression line that describes that relationship. And that allows us to extrapolate to look into the future and say, well, what happens if temperatures get warmer in the spring than they have ever been in the historical record? So keep that pattern in mind for the American robin and compare it to the wood thrush. And you see a very, very different pattern. 
uh, there is essentially no relationship between temperature and when wood thrushes arrive. They are arriving around that first week in, in May, regardless of what Wisconsin uh, uh, spring climate is, is like. So in very little variation, which is again, what you might expect for a species that's timing its migration based on photo period rather than uh, temperature. So we can do these kinds of graphs now for over a hundred species of plants and animals for which we have enough historical observations uh, to make a significant relationship uh, possible. So looking at, uh, at these graphs, as I said, the, the nice thing about these is that once you've established that regression line, it allows you to predict what might happen under unprecedented conditions that have never been experienced by these plants and animals. And many of you will probably uh, recall that we had an interesting uh, uh, chance to test the uh, idea that we could make predictions. If you look at what the um, climatologists are predicting for South Central Wisconsin by mid 21st century, you can see that they're predicting that the temperature, the average spring temperature is going to be over six degrees warmer um, than it has been um, historically. So there is going to be a very significant increase in the average spring, spring temperature. And why going backward there? Uh, so when we look back at the historical records, uh, we can see that in the not too distant future, plants and animals are going to be experiencing spring temperatures that are unlike anything um, that they had experienced in, in the past. So when we went back and we actually looked at those historical records, we found that lo and behold, in 1977, we experienced a, a, a record warm spring for that time. Spring temperature, the average spring temperature was 52.4 degrees, which is rather significant because that is actually slightly warmer than what the climatologists are predicting is going to be the new average spring temperature by mid-century. So lo and behold, we don't even have to extrapolate to know how plants and animals are going to respond to the predicted average spring temperatures uh, because they've already experienced it in 1977. They've already showed us, since we have phenological records, uh, they've already showed us how they're going to respond. Uh, but we all know that it is going to be warmer than the average in many of the upcoming springs. So it's still a valid question to ask of how are these species going to respond when spring temperatures are warmer than they literally have, have ever, ever been. And you will all probably remember that it actually happened. In 2012, we had the all time warmest spring on record in Wisconsin. The average spring temperature reached 53.9 degrees, warmer than it had ever been, warmer even than the 1977 uh, previous record. So that year, 2012, I was kind of like a, a kid on Christmas Eve, waiting for the last of our phenological observations to come in in May, so that I could see whether we were able to correctly predict, based on the phenological historical records, when plants and animals were going to undertake their uh, seasonal events in this unprecedented year. And fortunately, uh, things worked out pretty much the way I had uh, imagined. It turns out uh, if we focused on 23 spring flowering wildflowers for which we have records in every year from 1935 to 45, and then again from 1977 to 2012, these plants all show strong relationships with spring temperatures. And um, as a result, it was of interest to see whether we could actually predict when they were going to blossom, when they were going to bloom in 2012, when temperatures reached these unprecedented levels. And we were able to predict correctly when they bloomed. And it was, of course, a record early blooming for almost all of these species. 
Well, I was really excited about this and started talking to several of my colleagues around the country, um, one of whom, uh, Richard Premack at Boston University, um, was also interested in keeping phenological records. And uh, when I told him what I had found, he said, well, you'll be interested to know that I've been doing exactly the same analysis in this record-breaking year using the observations that Henry David Thoreau made at his cabin in Walden Pond, near Walden Pond. And he said, and out, I found exactly the same thing, that under this unprecedented warm year, plants bloomed at a record early uh, date. And um, so we threw our, our data together, essentially uh, to co-publish a paper uh, using both of these data sets based historically on Aldo Leopold and Henry David Thoreau. And we were betting that there weren't many editors who were likely to uh, reject a paper with data based on these two iconic figures in the history of ecology and conservation in North America. And we were right. We published a paper in an online journal so that we could get the results out uh, quickly while the uh, record warm spring was in everyone's uh, fresh in everyone's mind. And we were able to show that the historical records were actually quite able to predict what happened in this record breaking year. So here, for example, are the results from our data in Wisconsin uh, for those 23 species of wildflowers. And you can see the strong relationship with temperature uh, blooming earlier in warmer springs than in cooler springs. And on the extreme right, in the warmest spring on record, uh, the red data point there is when things actually occurred. The, the vertical line there is our statistical prediction that it should have happened somewhere within that range, and indeed it did. So we knew that uh, at least for these species of wildflowers that we were monitoring, uh, that they are adapting to climate change. And as springs get warmer and warmer, they just continue to bloom earlier and earlier. However, one of the interesting things about publishing in an online journal is that you get instant feedback from people who have looked at your article. And we got some, some instant feedback from plant physiologists who pointed out that yes, you've demonstrated that perhaps these spring wildflowers can continue blooming earlier and earlier in response to warmer and warmer springs, but this simply can't go on forever. They pointed out that physiologically, many of these early spring wildflowers have winter chilling requirements, which you'll all be familiar with. And that is that they need to experience a fairly long period of, of cold temperatures before they can break dormancy and start to uh, grow in the spring. And there's also the fact that blooming, the actual blossoming, uh, involves photoperiod. So in many cases, they pointed out that uh, it, even though plants may break dormancy earlier and earlier in the year, they may break dormancy so early that they're not experiencing day lengths long enough to stimulate blooming. So they said, you know, yes, you're correct so far that the plants are adapting, but essentially they're going to run into a, a brick wall at some point where they simply won't be able to bloom earlier because of these limitations of winter chilling or, or photo period. So all these plants and animals are for the most part coping with climate change, but of course just shifting the timing of your seasonal events is not the only challenge that you have in the face of climate change. And I love this headline from 2012 because it uh, is a, a perfect entree to one of the problems that species face, and that is that during spring they're not only having to cope with climate, but they're also having to cope with weather. And many of you may remember that in 2012, in that record-breaking year, the cherry blossoms bloomed at an, the earliest record recorded date in Door County. So early, in fact, that just a few days later after that record early blooming, uh, a cold front came through and uh, the sub-freezing temperatures uh, 
destroyed the blossoms and the cherry crop that year was something of a bust because uh, the blossoms had been destroyed um, before they had been uh, pollinated. So you not only have to cope with, uh, with climate, you also have to cope with Midwestern um, weather. There's another thing that happens, uh, happened that year as well in southwestern Wisconsin, and that is that the apple trees bloomed at a record early date. So early that they were sort of too early to be pollinated by insects. The insects hadn't emerged, and although they uh, bloomed at an early date, there weren't enough insects out yet to uh, pollinate the flowers. And as a result, a lot of those blossoms weren't pollinated and the apple crop was a bit disappointing. So just sh being able to shift the timing of your seasonal events is not enough. There are other things that are happening, whether it's dealing with weather or whether it's dealing with the fact that you have to interact with other species, sometimes species that have important implications for your life history. And the so what of this is that although some species react to climate change and can adjust the timing of their seasonal events, other species don't. That's so clear in the historical records from Aldo Leopold and the current records. And this leads to what are often referred to as phenological mismatches. When two species that have a really important intimate relationship with one another get out of sync with one another because they're responding differently to climate change. This is perhaps most uh, uh, notable in terms of plants blooming earlier than their pollinators so that uh, blossoms don't get uh, pollinated but it also has many other implications when two species are interacting with one another. So given that phenological mismatches have important implications for species, we were kind of interested to go back and look at the Leopold data set to see whether we could find any phenological mismatches. Unfortunately, Aldo Leopold didn't pay much attention to insects. So we don't have uh, much to go on in terms of pollinators and, and, and plants. Uh, but if you remember Leopold's boyhood observation of skunk cabbage and um, Eastern Phoebes. And skunk cabbage being one of the earliest blooming spring plants is very uh, vulnerable to, uh, to temperature and is adapting to climate change by blooming much earlier uh, now than it did uh, in, the, in the past. So remembering that for an early arriving Eastern Phoebe, having access to a patch of skunk cabbage might be a matter of life or death um, in a cold snap. The question was, well, is this relationship between a plant and a bird still intact? And it turns out that it is. Eastern Phoebes are short distance migrants and they are arriving earlier than they did historically. And in fact, are still arriving about one week after the skunk cabbage starts to bloom in South Central Wisconsin. Uh, so this is a relationship that is still very much intact and these early arriving Phoebes still might get rescued uh, by the nearby patch of skunk cabbage. Other species may not be so lucky. Remember I highlighted the great crested flycatcher in Leopold's journals. Great crested flycatchers are long distance migrants, still arriving almost exactly on the same dates as they always did. Well, great crested flycatchers are what we call secondary cavity nesters. They nest in cavities, but they can't create their own cavity. So they have to use an existing cavity, maybe an old woodpecker nest, maybe a, a broken off tree limb that's rotted. Uh, but it turns out that competition for a cavity is incredibly intense in the natural world. All kinds of animals use cavities. Insects nest in there, mammals will roost in there, birds will nest in there. So there's a lot of competition for a good cavity, one that doesn't leak, one that has the right size opening, one that has the right size internal dimensions. Uh, the, the competition is intense and studies have shown that the winning strategy in this competitive uh, environment is to get there first and claim the cavity for your own. 
And for the great crested flycatcher, this has led to a problem. They're still arriving at the same date, but many of their most important nest competitors are short distance migrants and residents that are after exactly the same type of cavity, but are now beginning their nesting cycle much earlier than they did in the past, essentially beating out great crested flycatchers in that competitive race for a good cavity, which means that the late arriving great crested flycatchers well, in the worst case, they may not even find a cavity to nest in, or they may have to settle for a substandard cavity, one that uh, isn't ideal for them, where their nest success might not be as good as it would be if they were in a high quality cavity. So does it make a difference? Well, we know from the breeding bird surveys for Wisconsin that great crested flycatchers have declined almost 30% since records be keeping began in the 1960s. We don't know for sure how much of this decline is due to the competitive disadvantage that they face because they are not adapting to climate change, uh, but certainly it doesn't help to be losing out in competition for something as important as a nesting site. Well, wrapping this up and, and getting back to Aldo Leopold, one of the things that we frequently are asked about modern day environmental issues is what would Aldo Leopold have thought about fill in the blank? And of course, the logical question is what would Aldo Leopold have thought about anthropogenic climate change? Something that he knew nothing about and could not possibly have anticipated was going to be affecting uh, plants and animals in South Central Wisconsin. But Aldo Leopold did give us a very clear indication of how he would have thought about anthropogenic climate change. And it's summarized in what many consider to be Aldo Leopold's golden rule. A thing is right when it tends to preserve the integrity, stability, and beauty of the biotic community. It is wrong when it tends otherwise. And Aldo Leopold's own records have given us clear indication that climate change is affecting especially the integrity and stability and for many of you, perhaps the, the beauty of the biotic community in South Central Wisconsin. So I said that Aldo Leopold kept phenological records literally until the day he died. The way Leopold kept his records was to have a little pocket notebook that he kept in his shirt pocket in which he would jot down shorthand of uh, the things he would observe during the day. And then in the evening, he would write all of this out longhand in his journals. And as far as we know, Aldo Leopold's last written words uh, before he suffered a heart attack while helping a neighbor fight a grass fire up at the shack uh, was lilac shoots two inches long. And the only lilac bush anywhere near the shack was, of course, the lilac bush that his wife Estella had planted there uh, a decade earlier. You'll note the little pocket notebook that was in his shirt pocket when he died of the heart attack, uh, the grass fire that he was helping fight uh, burned over his body and charred the pages of, of his little pocket journal. But as far as we know, Leopold's last written words were a phenological record. Well, today, of course, keeping phenological records in the era of climate change is a very popular citizen science activity. You no longer even need to have a pocket notebook. Um, all you need is your smartphone or your computer uh, to be able to upload your phenological observations to some of these central databases uh, that are now thriving uh, with many thousands of, of observations coming in essentially every day. The National Phenological Network, uh, keeping track primarily of, of plants. Uh, eBird, the, the 300 pound gorilla of citizen science, keeping track of bird observations. But uh, basically there are now many ways for those of us, and I know many of you are whether you know it or not, uh, making phenological observations perhaps in your, uh, in your work in nature uh, gives you the opportunity to be an involved citizen scientist and upload your observations so that they can be used to try to find order and meaning in these observations as Leopold observed so long ago. To help you 
um, do this, the Aldo Leopold Foundation, where I'm a senior fellow, we publish an annual phenology calendar. This is very useful um, as a way to anticipate when events are likely to happen. So for uh, every day of the year, um, when something significant is going to be happening in, the, in terms of seasonal events in native plants and animals, uh, we give you a warning that today is a day when you might start to um, anticipate that an event might happen. Not that it is assured that it's going to happen on that exact day, but it's the date on which you should start to be aware uh, that it's about to happen. Some of you probably already uh, subscribe to the calendar. If not, it goes on sale every fall and has been incredibly popular. I think this year we sold almost 9,000 copies of this calendar. So uh, keeping, keeping track of nature has become a very popular activity. And as Aldo Leopold said so long ago, keeping phenological records is always about the pleasure of the search, just recording the good times that you have spent out in nature observing uh, things that are natural, wild, and free, as Leopold described it. But now it's also important that not only should you enjoy those events, but it's also important that you share those observations so that we can find order and meaning in the observations that you've made. So thank you. And uh, I know that uh, Melanie has been accumulating uh, questions for me to answer. So Melanie, I will turn it over to you and let me know. Yes, thank you so much. That was wonderful. Um, I have a couple of questions that were posted for you. Is there a difference between one-time warming events like 1977 and repeated more frequent warming events? Well, I think, you know, the plants and animals are responding to a particular year and what the uh, spring temperatures are like that, that year. Um, but I don't think it has any residual effect um, for the, say, following years, except in the context that as springs, for example, repeatedly get warmer and warmer as the climate changes, uh, we're going to almost almost certainly start to see evolution happening. We're going to see these plants and animals adapting to these new unprecedented conditions. It's going to happen slowly uh, because we're going to be talking about them coping with events that are outside of the conditions that they have ever experienced uh, during their history. So we're hoping that as the climate continues to warm, that we may see examples of plants and animals that at least so far haven't been able to adapt to climate change, that eventually uh, they will start to evolve and, um, and show that adaptation. Thank you. And then we just have a couple of questions about the phenological um, records mm -hmm. for the person who is kind of the lay naturalist who um, you know doesn't have experience with this or expertise in it. Is there any way to kind of start that process? What should they be starting to um, keep track of? Are there essentials that they should be writing down? And um, you mentioned some great websites that um, or apps that you can um, participate in. Is there a if you're just doing it in a book or a notebook, what should we what what should we be paying attention to and keeping track of? Well, the databases that I um, that I sort of introduced you to there are the principal ones that are dealing with phenology. So they're they're focusing on the first date on which events happen. Uh, but the only way you can figure out when that first date is, of course, is to be constantly recording your observations to see when that first date actually is. So if you want to participate in any of those citizen science programs, there's no real expertise involved except that you be able to correctly identify the species of plant and animal that you're reporting on. But other than that, if you're simply reporting on your, your wildflower garden in your backyard, uh, that is perfectly um, 
acceptable and very useful data. So it doesn't have to involve a lot of extensive field work. If you're just recording a few species in your neighborhood or in your yard, or if you're going out on a field trip and maybe recording dozens of species, um, it all contributes to the database and helps scientists make sense out of all these observations that are coming in from literally across the, the country from thousands of, of observers. I said eBird is uh, the, the big, big one, and it's so big that uh, the Cornell Laboratory of Ornithology that administers my old alma mater, that they administer the program. And they are now one of the main users of the Cornell supercomputer so that they can analyze all of the data that's coming in from bird watchers now literally around the world um, in real time. But all of the observations help. So don't be shy about joining. Um, as long as you can correctly identify the species, uh, those observations that you make are going to be quite useful. Thank you. And then we have a question um, just to kind of clarify, where would we get that phenological calendar? The phenology calendar that the Leopold Foundation publishes every year, um, we will we'll take orders starting usually in October. So if you go to the Leopold Foundation website, which is very easy to remember, aldoleopold.org, um, you can order the calendar and uh, it will arrive in late November, early, early December. As I said, over the years, we've done this for, for now, I think we're up to 13, 14 years and the popularity of this calendar has grown every year to the point where uh, uh, we've now had to actually go to an on-demand uh, on publishing uh, to accommodate all the people who um, order it and the many who forget to order and don't order it until January. Uh, so we have to actually print extra copies to satisfy their demand, but uh, we satisfy every request. So next year, well, actually you can go and order this year's calendar, uh, but for next year, for 2022, uh, go to the Leopold Foundation website and you can place your order in the fall. Awesome. Thank you. And that was the last question that we have posted. Um, but I did have someone that said no questions, but sincere thanks for your wonderful presentation. So you've got a couple of shout outs on there about all this incredible information that you gave us today. Um, you made Aldo Leopold come to life and um, tracking of phenology so accessible. So thank you so much. Well, and your group is, of course, a very important group because of probably out of all the citizens of Wisconsin, uh, the master gardeners, the master naturalists are the individuals who have that knowledge to be able to identify uh, a variety of plants and animals and uh, who are out there making observations that can be quite useful. So thank okay. you for inviting me. Yes, I have one more if you have a moment. Sure. Um, you mentioned that there are a few records of how insects figure into phrenology. Are we rectifying this lapse? Seems important, especially where pollinators are concerned. Yes, indeed. You know, entomologists are now sort of catching up and encouraging citizen scientists to uh, contribute data. And a lot of that data comes through the National Phenological Network. So they are collecting insect data. For some reason, historically, um, people like Aldo Leopold and, and, and Bill Shorger uh, really didn't monitor insects very, very closely. Uh, there are a few observations of insects, but not enough to really make much sense out of historically. Historically, the insects that we do have good data on um, are often crop pests rather than pollinators. So we have a lot of um, sort of data on, on when various types of pest insects um, emerge and, and hatch and, and become sort of pests on our, on our, on our crops. But we're catching up and obviously the phenological mismatch between pollinators and the plants that they pollinate is now starting to become uh, quite a topic of great interest. Thank you. Um, one last question real quick. We talked about the websites. Do you know if there are apps that are very good at tracking this data um, for phenology? Well, each of those citizen science programs that I mentioned, the National Phenological Network and eBird, both have um, have apps that you can use on your smartphone. And of course they have central databases that once you're sort of logged in and, and an observer, 
you can upload your observations, you know, anytime, anywhere in the world, as long as you have a connection. Right. Brings um, Aldo Leopold's work to a no, whole new level, doesn't it? That's awesome. Well, it's amazing. The guy was so far ahead of his time on so many issues. And it's only now that we start to appreciate some of the things that he was uh, observing and, and writing about, uh, you know, 80 years ago.